In this presentation, we continue to explore the area of inventory valuation with special emphasis on study question number two. Now, sometimes you may be placed in a situation where you need to estimate the value of ending inventory. A popular method used to determine the ending inventory is the gross profit method. Let us quickly have a look at the steps involved in employing this method. Now, we know from financial accounting that sales revenue minus our cost of sales is equal to gross profit or some persons say gross margin. It follows therefore from this that cost of goods sold must be equal to sales revenue minus the gross profit. So that's step one. Cost of goods sold is equal to sales revenue minus gross profit. Cost of goods sold could also be calculated in by another method. We know that our beginning inventory plus our net purchases minus ending inventory is also equal to cost of goods sold. Remember that the exercise here is to estimate the value of the ending inventory. So in math, we, are, we have something that we refer to as making something the subject of the formula. So since we want to find ending inventory, we have to make ending inventory the subject of this formula, which says cost of goods sold is equal to beginning inventory plus our net purchases minus the ending inventory. This means, therefore, that my ending inventory must be equal to my beginning inventory plus my purchases minus my cost of goods sold. Now let us demonstrate this in a question. So let us now go to question two, part A. Now it says to us there that this company began the year with inventory of $50,000. They purchased $250,000 worth of goods during the year. They say sales for the year are $500,000 and they have a gross profit percentage of 55% of sales. They say we are now to compute the estimated cost of ending inventory using the gross profit method. Now let us write down first of all what we are given. Sales they tell us is 500,000. Gross profit margin is 55% of sales. Our beginning inventory is $50,000 and purchases stands at 250. Now firstly, we are going to calculate cost of sales. Since this, we know that sales minus cost of sales is equal to gross profit. We know also that cost of goods sold is the sales less the gross profit. Mm -hmm. They tell us that gross profit is 55% of sales. So sales is 500,000. Gross profit is 55% of that 500,000, which is 275. So it means then that cost of goods sold is 225,000. Step two. Remember, we know that our beginning inventory plus our net purchases minus our ending inventory is equal to cost of goods sold. And from that, we said that ending inventory is therefore our beginning inventory plus our net purchases minus cost of sales. So we know that cost of sales is 225000 We know the beginning inventory figure. We know the purchases figure. So let us now substitute. Beginning inventory is 50000 plus our net purchases of two fifty. Minus our cost of goods sold of 225, that must be equal to our ending inventory, and that is 75,000.
So that takes care of part one or part A of question two. Now, in order for us to address part two of question two, we have a couple of things that we need to look at. We refer to these as events affecting inventory valuation. Now, you need to be familiar with the treatment of these circumstances so that when you are doing up the inventory record, you know exactly what to do. So here goes. We need to know how to deal with what are referred to as trade discounts. We need to know how to deal with returns. Return of inventory to suppliers. Return of inventory from customers, or in some instances we could say from stores. We need to know how to deal with shortage of inventory. And we need to know how to deal with excess inventory. So let's take each of these. And in dealing with them, we are looking at how we would present them in the inventory record. Remember that in the inventory record, you have four columns. Date, purchases, cost of goods sold, and inventory. So let's see how each of these would be reflected. So let's start with the trade discount. Now remember that trade discounts are given for bulk purchases. Trade discounts are given for bulk purchases. It therefore means that the trade discount should be deducted from the gross or list price and it should not be shown in the inventory record. It therefore means, supposing you bought some items for $2,000 each and they say to you that there's a trade discount of $100 on each item. It therefore means that these units are going to be carried on the books, not at $2,000, but at $1,900 each. That is the $2,000 minus the trade discount of $100. Next, returns to suppliers. Now, let's see what happened when we got the units from the suppliers. When we got the units, you would have reflected them under the purchases column. Mm -hmm. It therefore means that should we send back some of these units to the suppliers, we would need to take them out of the purchases column. Not only are we going to take them out, we need to know at what price. The only price we can take them out at is the original price at which they were received. In taking them out of the purchases column, we remember that we have sent them back. So it's also going to be taken out of our inventory balance. So remember now, returns to suppliers, taken out of purchases at their original price received, and taken out of the inventory balance as well. Next, returns from customers. Now, you have to think carefully on this one. Remember that in the perpetual inventory system, when we sold items, we had to reflect the cost of those items. We had to reflect the selling price of those items. So if, it therefore means if some of those units that were sold are subsequently sent back to us, it means that we will need to add them back to our inventory. Mm -hmm. And it means also that the cost of goods sold column is going to go down because remember when we sold them, we took them out, we reflected them in the cost of sales column. So now that they have come back to us, we have to take them out there. And we would need to add them back to our inventory. So we take them out of cost of sale at the cost at which they were sent. And we add them back to our inventory balance. That is the cost side. In addition, we would also need to show that... It impacts our sales revenue because we would have to reduce the sales revenue by the sales returns. Remember in financial accounting, sales revenue 
minus your sales returns and allowances give you your net sales. So returns from customers affect our inventory record, affect sales revenue. Now, inventory shortage. A shortage of inventory, it means it could have come about as a result of a number of things. But in most instances, it's because employees stole from the business. If the inventory is short as a result of pilferage, it is going to impact our bottom line. That is, it's going to affect our profits. Remember, to arrive at profit with sales revenue minus cost of sales. So in this case, then it means that inventory shortage is going to be added to cost of sales. If we increase cost of sales, we are bringing down profits. And we are going to add it to cost of sales at the price as per the method that we are using. That is, whether we are using the first in first out, the last in first out, or the average cost method. Also, the shortage is going to serve to reduce the inventory balance column. And please remember, shortage of inventory serves to reduce our profits. Excess inventory. We we'll mention this here, although in most instances when you do your stock take, you don't have excess inventory. Most times it's shortage. So it will be the reverse of that. You'd have to take it out of cost of sales and you would need to increase your ending inventory balance by the amount. So those five events, especially the first four, you need to know how to deal with them. So let's now turn our attention to the last section of question two. That is, this company, See-Through Inc. So we're going to go through date by date and prepare this statement. Pay attention here because your assignment is going to mimic this question, see through ink, which is in fact a past paper question. Now they say to us that these people, they sell hand-blown glass vases. They give us a statement of their purchases and sales for these units for the month of June. They give us a number of transactions. And they ask us in part one to prepare the inventory record for the business using, notice here, the last in, first out method. So we are asked to use the last in, first out method. Now first, on June 1, they tell us that they open with 30 units, notice here guys, valued at a total cost of 27000 So as I said to you earlier on, when we looked at the first question, you would now need to work out the unit cost by dividing the 27000 by the 30. And that would give us 900. So there we have our 30 units at 900 each. Next, we are told on June 3rd, we purchased 45 units at 980 each. Total dollar value there would be 44.1. So at the end of the day, remember the order in which we got the inventory is crucial. So at the end of the day, we have 30 at 900 and 45 at 980 and we add the two dollar amounts we go to june 5th on that date now guys pay attention we sold 55 units notice they say at one thousand six hundred dollars each please do not even look at the one thousand six hundred at this point let me use this occasion to say, selling prices are not shown in the inventory record. Selling prices are never ever shown in your inventory record. Your inventory is held at cost, not at selling price. 
So when you are reading that note, just simply say at this point, sold 55 units, full stop. Don't look at the selling price. Now, to demonstrate the last in first out, looking at the inventory, we have 45 units there at 980 and we have 30 at 900. We are using last in first out, so we have to take that 45 at the end first. The most recent are the first to go. And then we take the other 10 out of the 30. So at the end of the day, we are left with 20 at 900. Pay attention. Next, on the 6th of June, we purchased 70 units at 1,200 each. But a trade discount of 3% was received. Now, remember what we said about trade discounts. These are deducted from the gross or the list price and should not be shown on our books. So what we would need to do is to find the net. That is 1,200 minus 3% of 1,200, or we could say find 97% of 1,200, and that will give us $1,164. So it means then that on the 6, we have 70 units coming in, not at 1,2, but at 1,1,6,4. So at the end of that date, we would now have 20 units at 900 and 70 at 1164 and we put in our total dollar values next we turn to june 10th on that date we sold 60 units and those units are for 114 thousand dollars here again the 114,000 represents selling price. So just say we sold 60 vases. We are using last in, first out. We look at the inventory column. Those 60 would have to come out of the units that came in last. The units that came in last were those 70. So on the cost of sales, we would have 60 at 1164. So after that sale, we'll be left with 20 at 900 and 10 at 1164. Make sure that you're following. Next, we go to June 14th. On that date, we purchased 80 units at 1,100 each, but they say additionally, there was shipping cost of $200 per vase. Remember how we treat the carriage in. Remember, on a perpetual inventory system, freight in is added onto the purchase price. So in this case, these units are going to come in not at 1-1, but at 1-3. So let's go to a record there. On the 14th, we bring in these 80 units at 1-3. So look now at the end of that date. Let's look at the inventory now. We'll, be, we'll have an inventory. 20 at 900, 10 at 1164, and 80 at 13. Total dollar value, 133,640. Next, on the 18th, we sold 65 units. Remember, we don't look at the selling prices at this point. So here, we are using last in first out. We sold 65. The last units that came in were those 80. So it means then, on the 18th, under cost of sales, we'll have 65 at 1.3. So we are now left with 20 at 900, 10 at 1.164, and 15 at 1.3. Total dollar value, 49.140. Next, we turn to June 23rd. And they say to us that on the 23rd, we purchased another 75 units. 
but at a cost of 108750 Notice, a total cost of 108750 So here again, you would need to work out the unit cost. The unit cost would simply be 108750 divided by 75. And that gives us 1450 each. So we go to our record and we reflect that. 23rd of the 6, 75 at 1450. So now at the end of the day, we are left with 20 at 900, 10 at 1164, 15 at 13, and 75 at 1450. Next, we go to the 25th. They say to us, five of the units last sold were returned as the customer purchased an incorrect quantity. So here we are talking about returns from customers. If we go back to the 18th, on that date we sold 65 units. Looking at our records, those 65 were at 1.3 in terms of the cost. So these are reflected under the cost of sales. Now that they have been returned to us, it means that we need to reduce our cost of sales and we need to add back these units to the inventory. At what cost? The cost at which they were sent, which is 1.3. So we go to our record and we make note of that. Under cost of sales, notice there we are using brackets denoting we are taking them out. Uh -huh. So at the end of the day now, we'll be left with what we had before plus these five. Now notice, even though in inventory we have 15 there at 1.3, we are not just going to add on these five. Remember we said that on the first in, first out, and last in, first out, order is important. So in listing the inventory after that return, it would be 20 at 900, 10 at 1.164, 15 at 13, 75 at 1450, and 5 at 13. Notice, order is of paramount importance. Now, coming down, on the 27th, we sold 112 units. Selling these 112 units, we are using last in first out. So we'll have to start from the bottom. So here, the 5 at 1.3 would go first. Then the 75. 75 and 5, that's 80. Then the 15, that's 95. Remember, it's 112 we are aiming for. So far we are at 95. Is it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Then we have another 10. That's 105. So therefore, we need to take another 7 out of those 20. So at the end of the day, we are left with 13 units at 900 on the very last date. Now, please notice, guys, on the very, very last date, what they are saying. On the system, it is saying that at the 27th, we have 13 units. And these are at 900. What is the question saying? On the 30th of June, they did their stock taking. And the stock take revealed that there were only nine units. Hmm. The system says we have 13. The physical count says we have nine. So clearly then, we have a shortage. How do we treat shortage? Remember, it is added on to cost of sales. And we reduce inventory by the amount. So on the cost of sales, we'll have four at 900. Four because 13 minus nine is four. Remember that shortage must be added on to cost of sales 
and it serves to reduce inventory. So our inventory balance then is simply 9 at 900 as revealed by the stock take. So that then is our inventory record. Notice this one is a very detailed one. In part two, they ask us to do the income statement showing the gross profit earned. Before we get to that, we need to get some figures that we need to carry forward to that statement. So under the purchases and the cost of sales, we are going to add the units column and the total cost. So under the purchases, units 270, dollar value 338, 330. Under cost of sales, units 291, total dollar value 357, 230. So please remember guys, from this record, cost of sales is 357, 230. Remember the requirement of part two is to calculate the gross profit. Gross profit is sales revenue minus cost of goods sold. So here we already have cost of goods sold of 357, 230. So let's now go to our income statement. Remember that headings are very, very important. So we make note of our heading, see through ink income statement for the month to June. We start off with our sales revenue. Now, how do we get the sales revenue? We go back to our question and we pick up all the sales. This is where the selling prices would come in. So on the 5th of June, 55 at 16. On the 10th of June, the total sales 114. On the 18th of June, 65 at 23. Plus on the 27th, the sales there was for 280,000. So we add these four pieces together to get total sales revenue of 631,500. From this, we are going to less the sales returns. Remember that some of the units sold were returned. There's a five of the units that were sold on the 18th were returned. Remember that those units were sold at two, three each. Remember how we said that returns from customers are treated. We have to reduce inventory. We have to increase inventory, sorry, but we must re reduce our sales revenue. So here then, sales returns would be five at two, three. Total dollar value, 11,500. So our net sales revenue then would be 620. From this, we are going to take our cost of sales. Remember that we already calculated cost of sales from the inventory record. So we just go there and pick up that figure, 357,230. So our gross profit then would be 262,770. Let me say something to you. They could have given you some operating expenses, like your selling admin distribution costs. If they gave you those, you would now need to take them out of the gross profit to arrive at your net profit. Remember, under cost classification, we did the income statement. So we have the gross profit, less operating expenses, take us up to net profit. Now to complete this question, they ask us to journalize the transactions on June 6 and June 18 under the perpetual inventory system and the periodic inventory system. Now the transaction on June 6 is a purchase of inventory and the transaction on June 18 is sale of inventory. Now, since we have already prepared the perpetual inventory record, it should not be too difficult for us to journalize these transactions. So let us go to June 6. And remember that on June 6, we purchased 
70 units and the total dollar value was 81,480. Now remember that under a perpetual inventory system, the purchase of inventory is recorded as an asset. So therefore, on June 6, we will need to debit inventory 81,480 and we credit either our cash or our accounts payable. 81,480. Now, notice here I put either cash or accounts payable since it wasn't stated clearly whether it was a cash purchase or a purchase on account. All right? So we go to June 18. Now, remember under the perpetual inventory system, when there is sale of inventory, we need to have two sets of transactions. First, we need to show that inventory has gone down. And secondly, we need to recognize that we have earned revenues. So let's look at the inventory side of things. We go to our inventory record and at June 18, we are seeing there under the cost of sales column, those 65 units with a total cost of 84,500. So part one would say debit cost of goods sold. 84,500 and we credit inventory 84,500 and that of course is with the cost of the inventory. Now remember that those units, those 65 units were sold at $2,300 each. So it therefore means that the total revenue would be 65 multiplied by 2,300 and that gives a total dollar value of 149500 so to record that we would need to debit either our cash or our accounts receivable 149500 and we credit our sales revenue 149500 so that is in terms of the perpetual inventory system now once we have done this invariably we have the journal entries for the periodic system because on June 6, when there is that purchase, we know that under periodic inventory system, the purchase is going to be recorded as an expense that is purchases. So instead of having inventory here, we will have purchases. And then for the sale on June 18, under a periodic inventory system, when there is a sale, it is just one set of journal entries. So let's look at the JEs for those two. So on the 6th, we debit purchases, 81,480, and we credit either our cash or our accounts payable, 81,480. Then for the sale on June 18, we simply debit cash or our accounts receivable, 149,500, and we credit sales revenue, 149,500. Now, before ending this session, I want to throw in what I call a brain teaser. What if we were told that 20 of the units that were sold on June 18 were on account? How would this impact the JEs? Now let's look back at what took place on the 18th. On the 18th, we sold 65 units. If they are saying to us that 20 of them were on account, it means that the remaining 45 would have been for cash. So let us see how this would impact the JEs under both the perpetual inventory system and the periodic inventory system. That's all. So under the perpetual inventory system, on that date, remember, two sets of JE would be required. One to show that inventory has gone down and one to show the revenues that we have earned. So as we did before, we would debit cost of sales, 84.5, and we credit inventory, 84.5. Now, the difference is going to come in on the revenue recognition side. Because part is for cash and part is on account. So we would debit cash with 
103500 that is 45023 debit accounts receivable 46000 and we credit sales revenue 149500 and then for the periodic system remember it's just the selling price side that we would record so we'd simply debit cash 1035 Debit accounts receivable forty six thousand and credit our sales revenue one forty nine five hundred. Now I have a little assignment I'd like you to do for me, and I would like you to post your response to your discussion forum. What if you were asked to journalize the transaction on June fourteenth? What if you were asked to journalize the transaction on June 14? Now, if you notice the question there, on June 14, there is some shipping cost that we have to deal with. Remember, that is a treatment of freight in. So let us see how you will respond to that requirement. So guys, make sure that you go over this question as many times as you want to and make sure that you fully grasp the concepts as your second assignment, which will be posted in a matter of days, is going to be based on this area. All the best.